continuous flow through bins, wedges, windrows, and the batch method. We're gonna cover all of these large scale vermicomposting techniques and the pros and cons of each on today's video. My name is Steve Churchill, and this is the Urban Orm Company. So if you're interested in making worm castings in large quantities, grab your crayons and take notes because we're gonna cover each large scale vermicomposting method. Now there are always trade-offs when it comes to choosing a way to do vermicomposting. It's often upfront capital cost versus labor cost. Sometimes you treat quantity over being able to maintain precise consistency of the worm castings. And some methods really aren't vermicomposting at all as you might understand it. And we'll get to that towards the end. The one thing I wanna stress is that the methods you're using now at a hobby level, like buckets, Rubbermaid totes, and even the urban worm bag, probably won't won't work if you're trying to make it go at a business. So what looks like success at a small scale probably doesn't translate to business success. The second thing I want to stress is that large scale vermicomposting almost always requires something called pre-composting. The hobby vermicomposter can do what I do at home and put a five gallon bucket outside the door, add kitchen waste, and feed their worm farm every so often. Or maybe they grab some horse manure and toss it into an outdoor vermicomposting pile. There's only so much wrong that can happen at a small scale. Maybe that fruit waste starts to smell a little ripe, or maybe the manure gets warm. But when when you start collecting waste by the ton, those little problems become big problems. Unless you're starting with a waste that has already gone through a decomposition process already, you're going to have to manage and stabilize your feedstock by first composting it. The good news is that you don't need a multi-month composting process. You only need to compost it for four to five weeks until the material has gone through the hot composting phase and has begun to cool. What this does is make the waste safe to feed the worms and ensures your vermicompost operation doesn't become a death trap for worms or a stinky nuisance to your neighbors. And regardless of how you choose to do your vermicomposting, if you plan to sell worm castings to finicky customers, there's always a need to screen it to remove worms and coarser undigested organic waste. The need for pre-composting in the beginning and screening at the end are often big obstacles to getting started for potential vermicomposters. With that out of the way, let's get started. Our first method of large-scale vermicomposting is using one or several windrows. Think of windrows as long lines of heaped material on the ground or on a prepared surface. Lots of hot composting operations use windrows, and depending on the size of the operation, these windrows can be massive, but vermicomposting operations use shallower windrows. The simply named Worm Farm was featured on CNBC's Blue Collar Millionaires, and this is how they make their own worm cast in Northern California. They have a 10 acre property with windrows of composted cattle manure that they make gobs of castings with. And they mix these castings into a blended soil that gives them the majority of their revenue. My friend Francisco Niembro of the Mexico based Aldea Verde has set up dozens of windrow style operations in Mexico and the Caribbean. He starts with very shallow, narrow windrows that are very dense with worms. They feed weekly for the next 10 to 12 weeks until the windrow is about eight feet wide by two feet tall or so. Then they reduce feeding and watering and they cover the windrow with plastic to trap moisture and attract the worms higher in the pile. And in the very early morning of harvest day, they remove the top four inches of material, which is very rich in worms, and they'll use that to start their next windrow. They're left with processed, mostly free worm castings that they put through a screener. The pros of windrows are the simplicity and relatively low cost. You're simply having worms work through a pile of organic waste. Windrows are usually used for hot composting, but there's nothing saying you can't use them for vermicomposting as well. This is a simple, less costly form of vermicompost but it does have some downsides. You'll need a compost turner, a compost turning attachment. You're probably gonna need a lot of manual labor to form a large windrow, and that can be a significant investment. You'll also need to harvest the worms from the pile or otherwise have a way to get them out of the way before you harvest worm castings. And I just described how Francisco did it, and that's no small feat. One interesting option to use is what's called a walking windrow, where you keep feeding just one end of the windrow with fresher material, thereby making it longer, but attracting the worms to the fresher end. The idea is that you can then start the harvest harvest process at the other end of the windrow. Windrows are also not an efficient use of space, so they should probably only be used by operators with a lot of space. Windrows are almost always gonna be outdoors as well. This makes it tough to maintain consistency as you're gonna have varying temperatures throughout the year, varying levels of moisture, and you also may have birds and other critters visiting your windrows for a free snack. Windrows are almost always gonna be found in warm weather areas like Durham, California, where the worm farm is located. Bill Jacobson of Lakeshore Vermicomposting uses outdoor windrows with cattle manure just just like the Purser family does with the worm farm. But Bill is in Wisconsin, and he keeps smaller outdoor windrows all year round by actually promoting some amount of hot composting in his winter piles by adding more fresh cattle manure than he might in the summer. All right, continuous flow. 
One method that is an efficient use of space is continuous flow through bins or CFTs. Think of a CFT as an elevated container raised off the floor. Commercial CFTs have a mesh floor, and during harvest, a cutting bar slices off the bottom inch or so, breaking it free from the somewhat compacted material above, allowing that harvested material to fall to the floor or perhaps a conveyor below. The elegance of CFTs is that the bottom harvest means that the ecosystem of worms and microbes doing the hard work above are undisturbed, so you simply feed from the top and harvest from the bottom. A continuous flow bin is continuous. Unless you've got a malfunction in your machine, you should never have to empty it and start over. Two most well-known CFT manufacturers are Michigan Soilworks, now branded as Worm Gear, and a Turkish company called Amosis. I own and operated a 16-foot Michigan Soilworks, or Worm Gear, CFT here at Urban Worm HQ when we were still producing our own worm castings. Notable farms that use CFTs are Worm Power in Avon, New York, and Terravesco in Sonoma Valley, California. I love CFTs for the efficiency of space, but they have two main downsides. The first is cost. There's no way around it. CFTs are expensive. For a new small CFT, expect to pay at least $6,000 before freight. If you want a 40-footer or longer, that's going to cost you over $25,000 before freight. Now, at the current time, I'm a reseller of the plans for an 8-foot worm gear CFT, and with your purchase of plans, you'll get a suite of CAD drawings that any skilled fabricator can use to make a CFT. You'll get detailed assembly instructions, and you'll also get worm gear's patented cutting bar shipped to you. There's a metric version available as well for Canadian customers. This package costs about $15 dollars so it's not chump change, and you can expect to pay around $1,200 to $1,500 in raw materials to make your CFT, plus whatever labor you pay your fabricator. So while it's cheaper to make your own CFT, it's not cheap. But it's not just financial cost that's an issue. Mistakes in a CFT are costly in terms of time. The most common mistake to make in a CFT is poor moisture management. If you add too much water, it's going to run to the bottom, and worms are attracted lower by that moisture, so your harvest will be compacted due to the moisture, and it's going to be rich in worms, which defeats the point of having a CFT in the first place. It can take several weeks or even months for you to harvest out the mistake. CFTs, due to the moisture issue, need to be kept indoors, preferably in a climate-controlled facility. So not only do you need to pay for an expensive machine, you also need to house it and keep it warm or cool, depending on the time of year and where you're located. So yes, I think CFTs are the best when it comes to using space efficiently, but you're going to pay for that efficiency. There's an interesting take on continuous flow that doesn't require expensive machinery, and it's the continuous flow wedge. Some people call these CFWs, but I think that's a bit of a mouthful, so let's just call them wedges. Here's how they work. All you need is a wall and a floor, and you start by adding worm-rich material to the intersection of the wall and the floor for as long as your space along that wall is going to let you. It creates a triangle, or a wedge, of material flanked by the floor on the bottom and the wall on one side. You simply periodically add material to the face of the wedge, attracting worms away from the processed part of the pile into the areas of fresher waste, much like you might with a walking windrow and much like you might with a CFT where you're adding the uh, material to the top where the worms move higher. There are two operations I know of that use wedges. One is the Arizona Worm Farm, which has multiple wedges that are always at work. The other is the vermicomposting operation at Michigan State University, where they take pre-composted cafeteria waste and make wedges on either side of one of their greenhouses. And just like the windrows Bill Jacobson uses in Wisconsin, the heat from the not fully composted material keeps the worms going in the cold winters in East Lansing, Michigan. That greenhouse is not heated. Now when you're ready to harvest, you can begin harvesting from the wall side of the wedge. You can use something as big as a bobcat or you can even just use a shovel and go along that wall and just start scooping out those process castings. If you're smart like Zach Brooks of the Arizona Worm Farm, you can make that wall a temporary wall made of plywood that you can move to facilitate that harvest. In fact, you can take that wall to the other side and reverse the direction of the wedge once you're done with the harvest. It's a very simple operation and while I don't think you get the overall efficiency you get with a CFT, a wedge gives gives you a larger than hobby level vermicomposting capacity at what could be a hobby level startup cost. Like CFTs, wedges should be under shelter in order for you to control moisture, which as you've heard is key for continuous flow. Wherever you're trying to attract the worms is where you want the most moisture. All right, let's talk about the batch method of vermicomposting. Most vermicomposting methods rely on worms to migrate to areas of fresher waste, removing themselves from the areas where you want to harvest. Maybe with the exception of windrows, the other methods I mentioned never have a defined endpoint where you stop harvest the whole thing and start over. Batch methods simply do vermicomposting in shallow bins and each bin has a start and a finish. Five gallon bucket is a simple hobby level batch method setup, but lots of large scale worm casting producers use large metal bins where they place a predetermined weight of worms in a predetermined amount of material for a predetermined amount 
amount of time. Most of these producers are using a highly fragmented black peat, and the worms simply consume an already stable humus to convert it into a different stable humus called worm castings. The process is fast and repeatable, but peat is not considered a sustainable feedstock. My source of worm castings used to use peat as their primary feedstock, but they sourced it from land development projects where the peat needed to be removed from the land before construction, so it was environmentally neutral as they could make it. But the market wants peat-free products, and some governments are starting to mandate them anyways, so I'm glad our partner farm has moved away from peat towards leaf compost. If you're familiar with UNCO, they use a batch method, and along with a large farm in Wisconsin, they have a network of affiliates around the country who produce their wiggle worm worm castings. While I have concerns over what I feel are UNCO's exploitative business practices, and I may get to that in a future video, the batch method they use is effective, fast, and repeatable, but that method does not require a peat-based feedstock, so I'm glad to be part of a peat-free movement with my current supplier. Now, the cost of the batch method of worm castings production is highly variable, and this is where you find the trade-offs between labor and capital expenditure. You can use a low-cost but labor-intensive system of small buckets, or you can use a low-labor but very expensive automated operation with bins that can weigh close to 500 pounds. My partner farm produces close to 3 million pounds per year with two employees, but they spent nearly $200,000 on equipment to get started. And that doesn't include the farm, the barn, or the tens of thousands of dollars of modifications they needed to insulate their operation against the cold Wisconsin winters. Pros of a batch system is the simplicity and speed of production and the consistency of the worm castings. And the cons are that most operations that use the batch method are not really vermicomposting at all as a lot of us understand it. The feedstock is already stable and it's highly fragmented and the worms are just taking a humus, which is great for the environment already, and turning it into a better humus. They aren't taking a true liability like food waste and manure and turning it into an asset. But because the worms are simply finishing off what nature's been working on for years already, batch producers don't have to compost their feedstocks first, so they're able to make worm castings more quickly, hence more cheaply, than true vermicomposters. I can almost guarantee you that the least expensive worm castings you'll find will be made by these batch producers. And I hate to say it, but peat-based batch producers also have an easier time to get their castings listed by OMRI as approved for organic use. It's fairly simple when you think about it. A peat-based producer has an easier time explaining their feedstock than a food waste producer who has to prove the organic nature of all of the upstream sources of food waste waste in their end product. And the same goes for manures. You have to show to Omri that whatever the livestock was eating and pooping out was also organic. So that becomes pretty difficult. So we're going to wrap this up here, but if you're interested in scaling up your worm castings operation, I hope this has been an eye-opener for you and gives you some idea of the trade-offs you'll face, especially when it comes to upfront costs versus labor. It's simply not cheap to start an operation that makes very inexpensive worm castings. So this video may either excite you to start an operation, but it also might make you tap the brakes a bit. Now I've been writing a course for the past several months on how to start a worm or worm composting business. It's going to be a video-based course, and I'll be honest with you, my time is pretty limited, so I'm not 100% sure if I'll ever shoot the videos or release this course. But if I do, and if you want to be the part of the first group to take it, please click this little link above my left shoulder or find the link in the video description below. You can join the waitlist to get discounted access to the course launch, whether that happens this year, next year, or sometime in 2040. The number of signups I get may validate whether there's a real interest in a course like this at all. And if you happen to be watching this after I release the course, just check the video description for a link to sign up. Okay, gang, that's it. We're gonna see you on the next video.